smile on your face. That should make you happy, fill your heart, even your liver up with, with just all kinds of good things. Thank you, Liz. Awesome. This is the worship service for Fletcher's Chapel United Methodist Church uh, on March the 14th. We're glad you're with us. Uh, whether you're tuning in in the morning or in the afternoon or even during the week, whenever it might be, we hope our service is meaningful for you and will touch your heart in some way. And we pray that, uh, that you'll be a little bit closer to God. Would you join me in this call to worship? God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Let all God's people cry out in joy. God's steadfast love endures forever. Come, let us worship the God of our salvation. Our first hymn is To God Be the Glory. We will be seeing the first and the last verses. with all the protocols 
Um, we will be wearing masks. We will be socially distancing. The church is marked off. The, the sanctuary uh, will be marked off, but we will be able to get together for a worship service. We, unfortunately, we will not be able to sing or do some of the things that we're used to doing. But if our proposal uh, goes through council tonight, and if it is approved by the district superintendent, um, we hope to be open by Easter and to, to stay open thereafter. Uh, keep in tune, as they say, watch this space, uh, and you can, uh, you can see, uh, keep going with us as to what our plans actually are going to be and how they're going to be fulfilled. Um, we've got a thank you here. Uh, if you come by the church or come by the parsonage and notice out front on the front porch, there is a railing uh, that is uh, up on the front porch, uh, helping us get in and out a little bit. Uh, we've had a few problems with aches and pains and, and knees and backs and so forth that don't want to work properly. But uh, thanks to, to uh, Kenny Newton and Troy Thompson for, for putting that railing up there, and that's going to be a big help getting us in and out of the house. And the last thing I've got here is uh, after we record next Wednesday, um, from Thursday through the following Monday, Jerry and I will be spending some time away. Uh, I'm going to go on a, a little four-day vacation. I haven't had one in over a year like most of y'all, um, but that's what we're going to plan to do. And uh, I don't have totally in place yet who's going to be fulfilling in for me for a uh, in case of pastoral emergencies, but if there is an emergency need for pastoral care, contact our lay leader, Marie Williams, and she will know who that pastor is to call. It will be somebody local. So, uh, and, and we will, uh, I will be fulfilling uh, preaching duties that following Sunday on the line, as I have been, because we will record that early. But uh, keep in mind, we will be away for that period of time. See, I believe that's all of the announcements that I have. Um, our prayer this morning is for the mind of Christ. If we are Christians, then we should be, uh, hopefully, having the mind of Christ in us. And we're going to have a litany, if you will. Um, the words, the response to this, and I'll give you an opportunity perhaps to... Uh, to, to think about it, to, to uh, say it back to me when the time is appropriate. May this mind be in us which was in Christ Jesus. May this mind be in us which is in Christ Jesus. You say it. You say it with me. May this mind be in us which was in Christ Jesus. There'll be several places along the way and you'll hear me begin that and, and I would invite you to to recite it with me. Remember, may this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Let us adopt a prayerful attitude. Let us remember Jesus, who though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor and dwelt among us, who was content to be subject to his parents, the child of a poor couple's home, who lived for 30 years the common life, earning his living with his own hands and declining no humble tasks, whom the people heard gladly, for he understood their ways. May the mind be in us which was in Christ Jesus. Let us remember Jesus, who was mighty indeed, healing the sick and the disordered, using for others the powers he would not invoke for himself, who refused to force people's allegiance, who was master and lord to his disciples, yet was among them as their companion and as one who served, whose desire was to do the will of God who sent him. May the mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Let us remember Jesus, who loved people, yet retired from them to pray, rose a great while before day, watched through the night, stayed in the wilderness, went up into a mountain, sought a garden, who, when he would help a tempted disciple, prayed for him, 
who prayed for the forgiveness of those who rejected him and for the perfecting of those who received him, who observed the traditions, but defied convention that did not serve the purpose of God, who hated the sins of pride and selfishness, of cruelty and impurity. May this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Let us remember Jesus, who believed in people and never despaired of them, who through all disappointment never lost heart, who disregarded his own comfort and convenience and thought first of others' needs, and through though his suffered long, was always kind, who when he was reviled, uttered no harsh words in return, and when he suffered did not threaten retaliation, who humbled himself and carried obedience to the point of death, even death on the cross, wherefore God has highly exalted him. May this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Let us unite in prayer that Christ might dwell in our hearts. O Christ, our only Savior, so come to dwell in us that we may go forth with the light of your hope in our eyes and with your faith and love in our hearts. In Christ we pray. Amen. The reading from the Psalter this morning is the 107th Psalm. I'll be reading verses 1 to 3 and 17 through 22. Psalm 107, 1 to 3 and 17 to 22. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good, because his faithful love lasts forever. That's what those who are redeemed by the Lord say, the ones God redeemed from the power of their enemies, the ones God gathered from various countries, from east and west, north and south. Some of the redeemed were fools because of their sinful ways. They suffered because of their wickedness. They had absolutely no appetite for food. They had arrived at death's gates. So they cried out to the Lord in their distress, and God saved them from their desperate circumstances. God gave the order and healed them. He rescued them from their pit. Let them thank the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for all people. Let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and declare what God has done in songs of joy. Let us affirm our faith together. Let us remember what we believe by reciting together our traditional Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our second hymn is one you all know, Amazing Grace. We will sing the first and second verses.
this would be the time when we would pass the plate um, from God's immeasurable grace we have been saved by faith in thankfulness for this mighty gift let us give thanks to the Lord and offer God homage as we offer back our tithes and our offerings. Please pray with me. God of light and love, as Jesus shined your light into our troubled world, may our offering bring rays of your holy light into the dark corners of the world. May our gifts reach the places where the fear of death holds sway, that others may find Christ's life in the midst of their pain. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today and our Gospel are tied closely together. Our Old Testament reading comes from the book of Numbers. I'll read reading from the 21st chapter, verses 4 through 9. Numbers 21, 4 through 9. They marched from Mount Hor to, on the Red Sea road round the land of Edom. The people became impatient on the road. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why did you bring us up from Egypt to kill us in the desert where there is no food or water? And we detest this miserable bread. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people and they bit the people. Many of the Israelites died. The people went to Moses and said, We've sinned, for we spoke against the Lord and you. Pray to the Lord so that he will send the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous snake and place it on a pole. Whoever is bitten can look at it and live. Moses made a bronze snake and placed it on a pole. If a snake bit someone, that person could look at the bronze snake and live. And our epistle reading for today is found in the book of Ephesians. And I'll be reading from the second chapter, the first ten verses, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. At one time you were like a dead person because of the things you did wrong and your offenses against God. You used to act like most people in our world do. You followed the rule of a destructive spiritual power. This is the spirit of disobedience to God's will that is now at work in persons whose lives are characterized by disobedience. At one time, you were like those persons. All of you used to do whatever felt good and whatever you thought you wanted so that you were children headed for punishment, just like everyone else. However, God is rich in mercy. He brought us to life with Christ. While we were dead as a result of those things that we did wrong, He did this because of the great love that He has for us. You are saved by God's grace. And God raised us up, seated us in the heavens with Christ Jesus. God did this to show future generations the greatness of His grace by the goodness that God has shown us in Christ Jesus. You are saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishment, created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding of his holy written word. And our Gospel reading today is found in the Gospel of John, and it will include some very familiar words to you, I'm sure. I'll be reading from John, the third chapter, the 14th through the 21st verses, John 3, 14 through 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, 
but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him isn't judged. Whoever doesn't believe in him is already judged because they don't believe in the name of God's only Son. This is the basis for judgment. The light came into the world, and the people loved darkness more than the light, for their actions are evil. All who do wicked things hate the light and don't come to the light for fear that their actions will be exposed to the light. Whoever does the truth comes to the light so that it can be seen that their actions were done in God. Would you pray with me? Most gracious and loving God, may the words that I speak in this moment and the thoughts we think and the feelings that we experience just now, may they all be acceptable in your sight. May they all continue to teach us how much you love us. And may they inspire us to want to live for you. In Christ we pray. Amen. First of all, the image was not an idol. An idol is the embodiment of one who is worshipped. An idol is itself an object of worship. An idol is a false god that one might pray to to satisfy one's needs. In the example, back in Moses' day, the golden calf, or household figurines in the houses of those that worship Baal, or perhaps a statue of Zeus. Now, on the other hand, an icon, and that's nothing to do with computers, but an icon is an image that brings to mind the true focus of one's faith. It is not worshipped. It is not prayed to. And examples thereof would be a cross, like behind me, even a crucifix, perhaps a stained glass window. As I stand here and look to the back of the church, I see Jesus with his arms outstretched. I don't pray to that window. But that window reminds me that Jesus Christ is there for me. It might be a window, it might be a painting, a painting of a portrait or of an event. So, this same God who gave Moses the commandment, do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth, do not bow down to them or worship them, because I, the Lord your God, am a passionate God. He also said to Moses, Make a poisonous snake and place it on a pole. Whoever is bitten can look at it and live. Why this seeming contradiction? Well, the occasion was when the people had escaped from the land of Egypt and the slavery that they were subject to. They were on their journey to the promised land. And the Bible records that on several places and several, several ways along the journey, the people got discouraged and they got critical of their living conditions. They had forgotten about how bad it was in Egypt, what it was like to be under the, the thumb of slavery of the Egyptian people, forgot how awful they had it there. And on their way, things weren't quite so great, but they complained about the food and little water they would whine and complain, as one fellow said, that's why they called them the children of Israel. Our Testament, our Old Testament text, refers to one occurrence of those times when the people were complaining and griping and grousing. The people complained, and God sent snakes. To let us remember that no matter how bad things are, things always can get worse. God sent snakes, many people were bitten, some people died. And as is often the case when these things happen, the people came back to God and they acknowledged their sin. They repented of their sin. They wanted to turn away from their sin. And they asked Moses to pray for relief. And that's when Moses prayed for that relief. That's when God told, told Moses, make a poisonous snake and place it on a pole. And when someone is bitten, they can look at it and live. The idea was not to worship the snake. The idea was not to pray to the snake, not to be healed by the snake, but the people who were bitten could 
look at that bronze snake. And they could be reminded of who God was. And they could be obedient to what God told them to do. And they could live. Now, fast forward about 1,200 years. Nicodemus, who was a Jewish leader, a uh, Pharisee, if you will, and he comes to Jesus, and you're probably aware of the story, he comes to Jesus by night. Now, we don't know why, whether he was ashamed, whether he was afraid of what his fellow Pharisees would do, or whether Jesus was just so busy during the day that, that, that he came to Jesus at night so he could get a little face time with him. But he came to Jesus wondering about this relationship between God and humankind. First, Jesus explains to him, <coughs> excuse me, First, Jesus explains to him that he must be reborn, become a new person, if he wants to be part of the kingdom of God. And then, as so often happens in John's gospel, between a person talking with Jesus, there's a two-level conversation where Nicodemus is all hung up in this idea of physical rebirth, yeah, how impossible it is for him to go back into his mother's womb and be reborn again where Jesus is talking about something spiritual. It's a spiritual rebirth, a changing entirely of one's attitudes, values, and beliefs, where you become totally a new person, thinking new things. Jesus is trying to explain how essential it is to believe, to know, and to understand that he, Jesus, came into the world to atone for the world's sin. Now, Jesus is familiar with the story of the snakes in the wilderness. That was in Old Testament Scripture, and we know that Jesus knew about Old Testament Scripture. He knew about the bronze snake. And he knew that Nicodemus knew that same story because Nicodemus was a Pharisee and a leader of the Jews and would be well-versed in what those Old Testament Scriptures were. And Jesus said, And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the human one, that's the Son of Man, be lifted up. He was referring to himself and what kind of a death he knew he was going to die. He goes on to assure Nicodemus that the relationship between God and people is more about love and grace and forgiveness than it is about judgment and condemnation and punishment. Then Jesus speaks, probably the first learned and most quoted most referred to piece of scripture in the entire Bible, what some people call the golden text of the Bible, or others call the Bible in a nutshell, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. That's as it's recorded in the Common English Bible, which we've been using to preach from. You probably remember it from the old King James. But then Jesus adds words that I personally feel are just as essential as those words that have been learned by everybody. And verse 17 that immediately follows those words Jesus said, Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You see, the rest of today's text further explains the essential nature of believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the only hope for the salvation from eternal condemnation. Jesus. Jesus, just as believing in the event itself is not enough. Just believing does not merit salvation. It doesn't take much commitment just to believe in that thing that happened. That once upon a time Jesus was crucified, was dead, and buried, and three days later he arose from the dead. No, believing in the death and resurrection of Christ as the source of salvation is understanding that we are all born into sin. Our natural tendency is to live for self-centered and selfish reasons. Living that way is a cause for our own condemnation to an eternity outside the presence of a living, loving God. But to understand that because he himself was sinless, Jesus paid the price for our sin. He died the death that was rightfully ours to die. For us, he defeated sin and death. 
by believing that God loved us so much to sacrifice His Son. And by believing that the Son, loving us so much, He suffered torture and death for us, we can receive forgiveness and receive salvation from sin and its consequences. If you believe not just that Jesus died, but that He died for us, for you and for me, we can be given the gifts of forgiveness and eternal life. Sometimes these days, it feels like less and less is considered sacred or holy. We are more concerned with our rights than we are with loving God or loving one another. I must say I've searched the gospel now several times over, and I have yet to read Jesus saying anything about rights. But Jesus talks repeatedly about love. He commands or directs. Now, I'm not saying that he suggests or recommends, but he commands and directs us to love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and love our neighbors as ourselves. He directs us to love our enemies. And the first new commandment that he gave to us was that we were to love one another as he loved us. And he loved us enough to die for us. The truth is, God loved us first, not because of anything that we did, but because it's God's nature to love us. If you look back into the epistles, you will find it there that God is love. But because God loves us, God gives us the opportunity for eternal life. That gift is ours to receive just by believing, but the evidence that we believe that we have received that gift is demonstrating our love for God, is demonstrating our love for our neighbors, is demonstrating our love for our enemies, and certainly demonstrating our love for one another. Now, if you've never before felt that belief, if you've never before out of a thankful heart committed yourself to loving God, loving neighbor, loving enemies, or loving each other, if you've never before desired to be born anew in the Spirit of God, or if you do know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and would like to recommit your life to that same love, I invite you to pray with me right there where you are. You don't need an altar. You don't need a chancel rail. All you need is a heart that desires to love Jesus and to receive the love that Jesus has for you. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we do understand that when we are born, we are born into sin. When we are first born, even as little babies, Lord, we, we know that our tendency is to want things our way, to want things for us. But we also know, Lord, that as we come to understand that you died for us, that you loved us, that you cared enough for us, that our punishment can be erased that your grace is enough for us. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today to, to offer ourselves to want to repent and turn away from sin and selfishness, or as we come to you today to recommit our lives to you, Father, we pray that you will take whatever sin and transgression we have away from us, renew our spirit with you, help us to be born again into that spirit, Help us, Lord, to want to live and love for you in all ways, in all times, and in all things. Gracious God, be with us. Forgive us of our sin. Build us up. We pray, Heavenly Father, that, that in our forgiveness that you will renew our life, renew our spirit. Help us to draw closer to you. We lift this prayer to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Our closing hymn is Because He Lives. We will sing the first and the last verses.
receive this benediction. God sends us forth with the immeasurable gift of faith. Live in the joy of your salvation. God sends us forth to walk in the light of holy love. Walk in the light of Christ. God sends us forth in spirit and in truth. Journey in the Spirit's tender mercies. Live with the blessings of God. 